Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're super excited to be chatting about Web Mapping 101 this morning. What is it and making it work for you? All right, and we'll just give everyone a few more moments to trickle in here this morning. We have a lot of folks registered for this webinar. Awesome. All right, and without further ado, let's kick things off and introduce our presenters. Hi everyone. So today you're in for a really good presentation on web mapping and we are so excited to be here. I'll start off by introducing myself first. My name is Sienna Emery. I'm a technical support specialist on the customer solutions team. And today I'm joined by Isanai and Mark. Do you want to say hi guys? Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so for the next portion, we're going to turn our webcams off to preserve our bandwidth, but we're just going to go through some web mapping concepts with you. So for today's agenda, first, we're going to be introducing the topic of web mapping and discussing how it works. After that, we're going to go through a few demos. So we have translating data to ArcGIS Online and a simple web map. Uh, we're also going to show off Mapbox and working with vector tiles. And then finally, we're going to do a custom code example using the HTML report generator before doing a Q&A and a wrap up. Uh, even though we say we're doing Q&A at the end, please ask us questions throughout. We have lovely people on Q&A on the back end of this webinar. So if you want to know anything, if you have any questions as we're going through, please feel free to chat them out to us. So why would people be interested in web maps? Web maps provide a widely accessible way to visualize data and share that valuable data. Um, anyone has access to the internet now, or I should say pretty much anyone, Lots of people work with web maps in their day to day lives. So it's just a great way of sharing information for the general public. So web mapping is the process of taking your data and displaying it on a map that's accessible to anyone. Um, oftentimes these web maps are used uh, to display data to the public in a way that they understand. Oftentimes, a web map consists of a base layer. So the base layer is like a reference on the world and then layers of data on top of it. They're often interactive. You rarely see static web maps anymore. So they allow users to adjust the viewing area, zoom in and out, select features to get more information, or even toggle on and off those layers. This is a web map that I've used a lot. Um, especially this summer. So if you know, this summer we're on the west coast of Canada and we had a lot of forest fires. So this was a web map I was checking quite frequently to see, is it okay for me to go outside? How is the air quality? So anyone has access to this map? If you look in the bottom right hand corner, it's super small, but you can see that this base map is a leaflet map based on that. And I can scroll through the different features here. I can click on them to get more information. I can also toggle on and off these layers. So I have all layers on right now. I can choose to toggle them on and off. So this is an example of a really good web map because it's easy for someone like me, who's just a lay person to understand what's going on and get the information I need to go about my day. As well, I wanted to introduce the concept of neo-geography. So when we we're talking to Dale Lutz about this webinar originally, this is something that he really wanted us to talk about because before there's concept of web mapping, there's a concept of neo-geography. So basically it's geography, but it's newer because it's not just a set of experts looking at the map anymore. You wanna present that data to non-experts as well. So there's a few different types of web mapping platforms if you want to get started. You have your web mapping applications. So these are out of the box applications. Pretty much all you need to do is upload your data. The website is already hosted for you 
and you can share a link to your web map really easily. Uh, analysis is typically built into that platform. So you, you don't need to do any coding. You don't have to see any coding. It's all hidden for you. However, some people might want to use web mapping APIs. So these are web maps that you access using JavaScript, CSS, and HTML to pull it all together. Um, but it does require a knowledge of these uh, different languages. You can create a very basic map using FME without the need for understanding anything like JavaScript, CSS, or HTML. And we'll talk about that throughout the presentation. So for different types of web mapping applications, the big one that I think of right away is ArcGIS Online. So we're an Esri partner. We use ArcGIS Online pretty much every day here. And on the right, I have an example of a dashboard that was created in ArcGIS Online. So it's a very easy platform. Just upload your data and you can get started. Uh, as well, the other ones that I'm aware of are Cardo and Mapbox. But if you know of any other web mapping applications you'd like to share, maybe just chat them out and we'll give them a shout out on the webinar. As well, I thought it'd be important to talk about if you have a BI tool, they might have some spatial compatibility as well. So the ones I can think of are Tableau Online, Click, and Power BI. I have an example here from Click. This was created for a BI webinar we did a few years ago that Nathan hosted. And it's example, I believe this is crime data on a map. So it is a way to visualize your data in a web mapping platform. On the other hand, we do have lots of different web mapping APIs. So we have some examples here hosted on uh, safe.com slash demos. So these were made with custom code, but we do have some non-coded examples on safe.com slash demos as well. So on the left-hand side, we have Mapbox. And what this Mapbox map is doing is it's receiving a, a stream of data that we're sending it from FME, and it's displaying those points on a map. So these points will change quite often. In the middle, we have an example of Google Maps. I'm sure most people could kind of recognize that. Um, in this example, we have a GeoJSON layer that's built into the map to highlight the area a user can select, and then they can download some data from that area. The one furthest on the right, that is an example of an ArcGIS API, and it's the same thing as the one in the middle. So it's a data download service that you can select an area on the map and get some data from that area. So you might be wondering, OK, so you're giving me options of different web mapping applications I could use, but how do I actually get my data into that web map? Well, FME can really help with that. So our strength is we bring the power of spatial data to your decision making. So we're really used to working with spatial data here at Safe Software. Our purpose is to get the data you need in the format you require. So just a little background on us. We've been solving data challenges for over 27 years. We're used by over 13,000 uh, organizations. We have lots of customers and partner services, as well as a very active community. This is the FME integration platform. So on the very left, we have FME Desktop. That's where you'll build and you run your workflows. In a little bit, I'll be giving a demo of what that looks like. In the middle, we have FME Server. FME Server is where you automate your workflows. And then we have FME Cloud. So FME Cloud is just a hosted version of FME Server. With FME Desktop, you can connect your different data systems use our custom transformer or use our transformers to uh, do something with your data and then you can either run this workflow over and over again locally on your desktop or you can publish it up to server where you can automate the workflow so let's get started with our first demo so this is how to get data into arcgis online and a simple html so uh, again, I mentioned that we work with Esri a lot and ArcGIS Online. FME has a built-in 
ArcGIS Online reader so you can get data from ArcGIS Online and a writer as well so we can push data to ArcGIS Online. So data from many sources can be combined, modified, and pushed to ArcGIS Online. And we have a really good tutorial there about how to get started working with ArcGIS Online or Portal. Once data is in ArcGIS Online, it can be visualized and analyzed. These maps, you can take them and embed them into an existing HTML page. So if your company has a page already, you can take that link and easily embed your web map there. Uh, maps can be shared, so you could share them just with your organization or with the public. And then these maps are all compatible with anything that you're going to view them on. So a web browser, ArcGIS Pro, smartphones or tablets, you can use these maps quite easily. We also in FME have the HTML report generator. So this is how you can take uh, your data and create a basic HTML page. The HTML report generator will take your geographic data and then automatically create a web map from that. Uh, this can be completed without any custom code or you can use some custom code in the HTML report generator to enhance your results. So let's get started. Uh, in this case, I have a feed of JSON data that's updated regularly and I wanna keep that data updated and posted to ArcGIS Online. I don't wanna manually do this and I don't wanna to have to upload the data every two weeks. Um, FME can help me by creating the solution and allow me to post the data. So now I have an automated way of pushing data to ArcGIS Online. So let's take a look. This is FME Workbench. With FME Workbench, I have readers and writers and transformers in between. So a reader is how I get my data into my workspace. So I can take this URL here and copy it and put a GeoJSON reader on my canvas. All I have to do is type it in to get it and copy and paste. I go and I run this, I can get all my data from this online source. It doesn't have to be an online source, it could be a file as well. But in this case, I want the most up-to-date data, so I'm using it directly from that online source. All right, next I wanna manage my attributes. I'm not sure if you took a look at everything going on here, but it's quite complicated. Um, I don't really understand what all of this means. So I just wanna simplify things and I'm going to use an attribute manager to do that. I have one custom built up here. I connect my reader to the attribute manager and I can open it up. So the first thing I'm going to do is rename some of these attributes. So Meg, I wanna turn that into magnitude, and then I wanna change the time and updated. Uh, it's in epoch time, which is seconds from 1970, and it's in milliseconds, and I want it in seconds. So I'm just doing a little calculation there. And I'm also changing the category based on the magnitude. So it's able to find categories online, and I've added them in here. So this is a conditional value. If the magnitude is less than 2.5, then um, an earthquake is not usually felt, but can be recorded by a seismograph. And then if it's higher than that, it's going to have a different value here. Next, I wanna push this to ArcGIS Online. One thing I am going to do is take that date time that's in epoch time and just convert it to FME time. So I can use a date time converter. My date time attributes I'll have to select. So I have my time and my updated. My input format, I can change that over to seconds. And then I can run this workflow to push my data to ArcGIS Online. One thing I'll note about this trans, uh, this writer that I've already set up 
is I'm going to insert all this new data and I'm going to truncate this data first. So I'm going to get all, rid of all the data that's already in that feature layer and push my new data to it. So I can go ahead and run that workflow. All right, perfect. So now I can take a look at ArcGIS Online. I already did some visualization of this feature layer beforehand, and the visualization is kept even though the data has changed. With ArcGIS Online, I can go through and I can click on my different attributes and get some information based on them. All right. So going on from there, I'm going to do a different example where I'm taking the same data and then I'm going to put it into an HTML report generator. So from this attribute manager, I can connect it to my date time converter again. This is doing the same thing, but it's just going to take it and put it in a more readable format. I have an attribute manager here. So with the HTML report generator with my data, I can have a pop-up. So I'm putting the data that I want in my pop-up there. These are some statistics I'm doing just to get a histogram made. Uh, this histogram will be turned into a bar chart. But I'm going to have my HTML report generator here. So in this first HTML report generator, I'm going to create a header, earthquake data, fun. Probably not the uh, actual header that you would use if you're using this, but you know, got to keep it fun. And then next I'm going to select a map, but there's various ones you can use and Sni will show off them in a little later, but I'm going to use Esri leaflet. This label attribute, that's the pop-up. The data is already coming in from my workflow, so I don't need to add anything in the feature layer URL, but I could have a URL there. And I'm going to select some satellite imagery. From there as well, I'm going to add another HTML report generator to create a bar chart with some of my statistics. So this X label will be my count and my Y label will be my value here. So what this is doing is this statistics calculator is creating a histogram with the magnitude. So for each level of magnitude I have, I'm going to create uh, basically just a count of them. And I can go and I can run the rest of my workflow and view that output HTML. Uh, so here is my map. Uh, as you can see, the visualization isn't as good as it is directly in ArcGIS Online. Uh, I did look up how you could change that. Unfortunately, it is through custom code. Uh, so the HTML report generator is good for giving you an idea of what your data looks like. But if you want to do some advanced visualization, you're either going to have to do some custom code or do something like use ArcGIS Online. I'll show how easy it is to fix your mistakes in FME. So I did not like that result. That is not what I wanted. So I'll go ahead and fix it here. Rerun this workflow again. Take a look at my output. And now I'll get the correct results. Ooh, there's a category seven. Um, anyways, so 
And this is my data uh, on the bottom. I have magnitude and then I have count on the side. So that's the magnitude of the earthquake and the count on the side. I think the seven might be a mistake because my attribute rounder might be rounding a category six up. But we can take a look at that later. Anyway, so that's what I have to show off right now and I'll pass this off to Sinai. Okay, next we're gonna talk about some FME tools for web mapping. Um, and web maps advance beyond the typical GIS uh, kind of realm because they also require knowledge of web development, databases, um, strange data formats sometimes, um, any number of things. So we're going to take a very high level overview of some of the important parts that maybe you just want to be aware of and highlight where FME can come in. And then you can pick and choose which tools best suit your workflow, whether you're a full-fledged web developer or someone who's never written a line of HTML and maybe doesn't even care to start, we can help you as well. Um, so what makes up a web map? Base maps are often working hard in the background. Traditionally, web maps use raster tiles. So rasters will load static images for each zoom level, but they're, um, but they're unchanging and they're not customizable. It's basically a JPEG or a PNG, and um, you can't do too much about it if you want to tweak it. Um, but if you've ever used something like Google Maps, you may notice that the features change as you zoom in and out, and that is a vector tile set, and they're made up of different layers that can be dynamically displayed or customized. Um, we don't often need a fully custom base map. Um, you can usually just grab one off the internet for free. Um, a general theme is uh, usually enough just to give your features context. And for the features, that's what we're interested in. And there is a lot of different formats you can use here. So they're typically vector points, lines, and polygons. And these features might be um, in a plain text format that the browser can interpret itself. Or we can reference other hosted data formats in our script. Kind of depends on your uh, mapping platform you're using. But GeoJSON is a great place to start. It's likely going to be compatible with any mapping application you pick up. Vector tile sets also function well as features, um, as well as all the customization. They're very lightweight, so um, they're great for working with large data sets. Uh, there's open source tools for creating tiles from standard spatial formats, but FME also has writers that can make that part a lot easier. Um, so here are some of the readers and writers for formats that you might uh, be using in web mapping. Um, some are more common than others, but uh, we likely have a tool for what you're doing. But web development uh, is the part that sets today's topic apart. So for a web page, just to sort of take a step back, and look at the different parts. We need the HTML to organize that content. We need the CSS frameworks like Bootstrap to style it. And then we need JavaScript to make it responsive. So because we expect to be able to interact with web maps like panning around and clicking on features, these are things that JavaScript does. Um, so there's both open source and proprietary JavaScript libraries that we can work with. And then the last part to a web map is uh, all the data and all of this script needs to be hosted on a server somewhere. So here are just some of the tools for um, all of those different parts of web mapping. So we have tools for building your scripts like the HTML report generator and layouter. And we also can connect to lots of different cloud platforms and databases for hosting your data. Um, and of course, we have FME server for automating these processes and delivering the data and keeping it updated. So the point is that FME can support a mapping uh, workflow in small or large ways. So instead of struggling to integrate dozens of services, which can really easily happen um, uh, in these workflows, uh, we can use FME to build and facilitate any part of that workflow. Um, it's really up to you uh, where you use it. It can be um, just you know, your data, or it can be a top-down front-end workflow for delivering a web mapping application. So before we get into demos, let's just take a quick look of everything we covered. I think it's important to understand how a web page, its anatomy. So once you get your web mapping application from FME, you can take that and customize it if you like. 
it's just good to know the theory. So here is a web mapping application that I built entirely with FME using Mapbox. Um, we're using a browser to look at styled content. So we know that we're looking at an HTML page with some CSS and this is kind of the skeleton of it. You can see uh, just some headers and some a table uh, set up here and FME created that for us. The background is a street map, um, and it's a specifically a map box base map that's referenced just in the script, and you can see it's highlighted up there. Then we have uh, some lines and some points there with some camera uh, markers that you can see. Um, these are our features, and you can see that each are referenced in the script. So we have at the top, we have some vector tiles there, uh, a URL to an MVT file. We know that's a vector tile set. And then the second is um, a GeoJSON file for our points, and those are both hosted elsewhere on Amazon. And then lastly, when we're looking at this map, we can point and click on things um, in the map, and that's just more JavaScript for you. So if you look in the script, there's even a function there for clicking on one of those camera icons um, and having the map do something for you. So those are the basic building blocks of a map, and each of those were built with FME with the exception of that little fancy function to click on the pointer and deliver an image. That one was a bit of customization. So uh, we're going to use FME Server for these next demos. This is our platform for automating, integrating, and facilitating enterprise-level workflows, and that's going to be really useful for all steps of web development. Okay, so we're going to carry on with Mapbox and use our HTML report generator to build a simple map with some of our own data. So we have a workspace to start with here. Uh, here we have a very simple data set and workspace. Um, we have a file database containing points for cultural centers and at runtime we can select which neighborhood cultural centers we want to see. Let's just select OK and run and we want to take a workspace like this and create a web application that allows our end users to select and view these points um, in the neighborhoods that they choose. Stream that back to them either on the browser or mobile. So the first and really only step we have to do is add a HTML report generator to our workspace. And you can see we have all these feature types. It might take a really long time uh, to connect all of those ports. So just a quick workbench tip if you're ever in this situation. Uh, we can use the feature type window to um, select all of the ports on one side and then their destination. Hit this connect button and it does it for us. After that, uh, we want to select our mapping template, and we've already seen Esri Leaflet in action, and uh, a little later we're going to see Google. Uh, for now, we're focusing on Mapbox. We have these options between the Leaflet Mapbox as well as the JLJS, or GLJS, um, which is their current product and built for the fastest rendering of vector tiles. Um, so that's what we want to do right now. Uh, we do need an authentication token for using Mapbox, and you can get one of those after making an account. After that, we set it up really similarly to the Esri ArcGIS web mapping template. We choose colors and labels. We can choose the base maps offered by Mapbox, uh, any WMS URLs. You might have some data online you'd like to include. What sets the Mapbox template apart is that we have this option to use the uh, vector layers, and we add these by feature layer URL as well as our source layer. And the easiest way to do that is to link directly to a tile set from Mapbox Studio. Uh, so let's go over to Mapbox Studio and we can see what that looks like. Uh, we're just interested in vector tiles, so avoid anything rastery sounding like DEM or satellite. Let's see, traffic sounds like it would be okay. Uh, so you can see inside here we have only one layer called traffic, uh, so we want to copy that for our source layer and we don't actually need a full URL we just need a reference to this tile set ID so let's copy that ID and go back to our workspace and inside the HTML report generator we can paste that and then remember we want the traffic layer just select OK so lastly we just need to add an HTML writer to our page and select to destination. And we'll call this our neighborhood culture app. Okay, we can add that to the canvas. 
So now we have a workspace where we can choose which layers to read, um, and then it creates a web map uh, dynamically from those layers and then streams it out as HTML with Mapbox. Um, so I've already uploaded this to FME server, um, and which we're going to have to do to share it with others. Um, so let's head over to FME server and create a web mapping application with um, server apps. So we're going to build a workspace app that uses this workspace. And we can give it a title and a description. Um, we can also customize workspace apps. Uh, so uh, you can add colors and your own logos, um, all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, we want to make sure that we're using the data streaming service and we select that when we publish it to server. And that's because we want to deliver the web map back to the end user um, at runtime. And here we see our parameters for um, picking neighborhoods. So I'll just select OK. We can take a look at this app. And these neighborhoods are fine for our first run. OK, so I've added some things like a title and a table to this particular map. But here you see we have all of our cultural centers on the map. And we've also enriched this map with the vector tiles from Mapbox. So if you're curious what this all looks like in the back end, you can inspect the page um, in your browser typically and take a look at the um, HTML. So you can see all of the elements that FME has compiled for us. We have HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, our table. If I open up the scripts tab, uh, this is where all of our Mapbox stuff is. So you can see all of our cultural center points have been written out in GeoJSON and it's super easy to understand because um, it's just a dictionary with keys and values. Uh, the other thing you might notice is that as we zoom in and out, that the vector tiles um, adapt to that zoom level. They get more detail or less, um, and uh, that our GeoJSON points actually don't do that. So that's a key difference between the two, and part of why vector tiles are the easiest way um, to offer some of the best end user experience. So just to recap, um, GeoJSON is a great bet for most web mapping. We can also use Mapbox Studio vector tiles inside of our workflows. And we can use FME server workspace apps with the data streaming service to easily share your web creations with others. Um, for this next demo, it's going to be pretty high level. But since we've sung the phrases of vector tiles, let's mix them together and use them in a map. Um, and I've already set this up in a workspace. Uh, this will save us from some more uh, of the tedious configuration, um, but this workspace will be available for you after the webinar to refer to. Um, but I'll just point out some highlights so we can get a better idea of how vector tiles work. So you'll notice that our starting data sets are um, state, county, and municipal boundaries. Um, it's just some polygons for each level. And inside of this feature writer, uh, we're writing to a Mapbox vector tile set. So each feature type is a different layer, and we can write out different zoom levels for each. This will allow us to mimic that sort of slick user experience as you do while um, using something like Google Maps or those vector tile sets from Mapbox. Next, uh, when we write out these vector tile sets, they'll produce a JSON metadata file. So I've written them out to this folder named New Jersey. And inside, these represent all of the different zoom levels. And then we have this metadata file in JSON, so we can see some things like the different layer names, um, any attributes associated with those layers, that kind of thing. Um, and inside of each of these zoom levels, we have MVT uh, files. So if we want to see these tiles on the web, we're going to need to upload them to a server. And in this case, in our workflow, I use the Amazon uh, S3 bucket that we have available. But you could use this on your own database. You could put this to Azure up on the cloud. Um, just make sure that they're publicly available um, if you're trying to use them on a public web map. Uh, and after we've uploaded our vector tiles to a server, uh, we can actually use them just as we did the Mapbox Studio vector tiles in that last demo. So I have a workspace that does just that. Um, 
everything is nearly identical to our last two demos, um, but opening up the HTML report generator, you'll notice that our vector tiles um, instead point to an Amazon uh, URL. So that is the tile set that we just wrote, and we have an entry for each layer that we want to see on our map. Uh, so municipal, counties, and state. So to view this on a map, of course, we can publish this workspace to FME server and see our results. So we can go back to server and we can run that works last workspace. With the data streaming service, we don't need to set any parameters for this. And we're zoomed in just because I have a center point. But as we zoom out, we'll see, we're starting to see the shape of a municipal um, municipal boundary. They're quite small, and as I keep zooming, those municipal boundaries turn into county boundaries at our next zoom levels. And then finally, we get the boundary for the entire state. So I think that looks pretty good for a 10-minute workflow. So to review, we can try out vector tile sets for more responsive maps, dynamic maps. In many cases, we can upload them to a server to use um, inside of our web mapping application, and we can connect to a lot of uh, different databases and cloud services through FME. And aside from creating your own vector tile sets, there's tons of open source data sets available online um, for web mapping that you can use inside the HTML report generator as well. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Mark to show how we can build on this um, with custom code and create a really cool uh, web mapping application. All right, thanks, Anai. So yeah, when you combine all these skills together and you're looking to add even more functionality to your web maps, you can extend the HTML report generator with custom code to turn your web maps into simple web applications. Tons of JavaScript libraries, APIs, and CSS frameworks can be incorporated into your web pages to design and style various components and add interactivity. This gives you a lot of flexibility to get creative and use your web programming skills in FME. And we did just that with a game running in FME server. So those of you who've been to our world tours in the past, you'll know that we've actually built games powered by FME like Fun with Flags and an Escape Room. FME strikes again, and this time we made a web map game for guessing where a randomly picked city is located based on a Google Maps satellite base map. So why did I use custom code here instead of the prepackaged Google Maps base map that comes with the HTML report generator? Well, I needed my own styling and settings in the web map definition, like locking the ability to pan, zoom, and display labels so that players can't cheat. And on top of that, I used some extra JavaScript and CSS to add a leaflet web map picker on the top left so that users can submit their answers. And I got this code online written by a web map developer. When the user submits their answer, a webhook URL is called for FME server to run a workspace that compares the user's answer to the actual answer and then displays the score. This whole process uses a combination of FME server running jobs with the data streaming service, webhook URLs, the FME server JavaScript library, and a custom web page template with the Google Maps base map. So the goal was to embed a custom web map uh, with some of my own interactive elements into a web page. And the way to solve this challenge was to use the custom code element in the HTML report generator so that I can have those automatically generated custom web maps based on incoming data. So now let's jump into the demo. So here is the workspace um, that I have for actually getting a random city around the world. And what I have starting off is just a shape file that contains um, just over yep, 2,500 different cities all around the world. You can see those displaying here with just points. And then the rest of my workspace is just grabbing one of those random points, and then it's passing that into my HTML report generator. And you can see here, I have just a custom HTML section. And when I open this up and give it a little syntax highlighting so we can see what's going on, you can see that this is all 
custom code for my web page. You can see at the top, I'm referencing a bunch of JavaScript libraries such as jQuery, and uh, I'm also referencing some CSS files and JavaScript files that I have hosted on our own S3 instance. And you can also see here that I have uh, the Google Maps web map definition, and this is all just JavaScript inside a script tag. And you can see here that I'm centering the map based on the randomly picked cities X and Y values. And you can see here with those extra settings that I am locking the zoom controls um, and I'm locking it on the satellite view. And then the rest of the web page is just for loading in that picker. Um, also some instructions for how to use the game and how to play and some extra code in the end, but I'm not going to dive into all the code and I'm just gonna show how this app works. So here I'm on FME server and this is the starting workspace that will load up the first round of the game. And as it loads, so it has opened up a random city in the world. Um, so team, where do we think this is located? Okay, so a southern coastline somewhere. It's uh, fairly green. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like there might be, uh, I think that's just an inlet at first. I thought it'd be a marina. Um, I'm, uh, I'm getting. I have no idea where this is. Yeah, there's like no. there's no cities around, which is harder to. The southern coast. I'm almost thinking like the southern coast of the states, like where Alabama is. Sure. So yeah, drop it in good. somewhere here. Yeah, sure. Let's give it a try. Let's try it. All right. Uh, just throw it somewhere random, I guess, right here. That and I'm going to submit the answer. And oh, we were actually not that oh. far off. Hey, so Cuba. Is in Cuba. Well, pretty close. That, um, so, that yeah. is a respectable result, I think. <laughs> it's pretty close. Yeah. So you can see here, um, and what I did was when I submitted that answer, it just um, took that point that we plotted onto that web map picker and submitted it to FME server to validate that answer. And then you can see here where it's loading up this custom um, pop-up. This is using bootstrap modals, and this is where you can add all this custom code into your uh, web pages. And then you can see I have another embedded web map to show um, our user versus the actual answer. And then requesting a new game simply runs the workspace again. You can also see in the top right corner, I've added another modal with instructions for using the application. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options here with how you want to customize your web pages. Um, the, uh, the limitations are endless. It's all up to how far you want to add the custom code. All right, so that brings us to the end of our demonstrations. And now that we're all ramped up, um, everyone dive right in and share your data with your web maps. Uh, to summarize the points and the topics that we covered in the webinar today, it's really easy to get into web mapping with just a few clicks and FME. If you're new to web maps, you don't need to worry about custom code, but um, we provide our own base map templates in the HTML report generator that work instantly with your data. And the HTML report generator is the place to go and you have the flexibility to uh, make your own web maps as simple or customized as you like, whether it be just picking one of the base maps that we provide or going with your own custom vector map tiles. The best part about web mapping is that you can share your data visually and in an easy to understand way to anyone, anywhere, at any time. And they're easy to use for even non-technical people. So it's a great way to make your information and decision-making products widely available with the help of FME. So 
uh, for next steps. Uh, if you have anything that you'd like to chat with us about regarding your projects or your data challenges, feel free to contact us at info at safe.com and we'd love to chat with you. Um, also download our latest release of FME and you can also download the workspaces in this webinar once it's published. Um, also, if you'd like to get a free trial of FME desktop or FME server, um, you can certainly find that and those download links on our website. And take these workspaces that we showed you in the webinar today and apply them to your own data challenges to break down those barriers and make your lives a whole lot easier and for everyone and sharing those data projects that you have. And for resources to learn more about web mapping, we have a couple of blogs that we have online. Uh, one is for an, our ultimate guide on online mapping. We have another one with uh, eight ways to visualize your geospatial data in a web browser. And if you want to learn more about our HTML report generator, we have an article on that. And for getting started with ArcGIS online, we have another tutorial on that as well. Thanks, Mark. I think I can take over for a few seconds and then we can go to Q&A. So as a thank you for joining our webinar today, uh, we do have a community badge for you. So claim your community badge at fme.ly slash webinar badge and I will send out the link in the chat here. Uh, we always love to hear your feedback. So if you are able to spend some time and send in a review, we do appreciate that. And I will also chat out the link. Our 2022 UC, the pick off data. Our 2022 UC, the pick off data integrations is coming up. Uh, again, the link to register is chat out now. So before moving on to our Q&A, make sure to check out our website, safe.com slash webinars for some upcoming and on-demand webinars. So here I will pass it over to our presenters. If you haven't had a chance to ask your question during the webinars, you can do it now using our question panel. Hi everyone. So hopefully everyone can hear me. Anna, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Sorry, my headphones died right before this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so if you have any questions for us, please reach out in the questions panel. We did have one. I'm not sure, uh, Sanai, if you wanted to go for that. Yeah, sure. Um, Arthur was asking uh, to just go over that tip about managing feature, or sorry, feature type connections in a workspace. So if you're finding that you are dragging uh, connections between feature types on, say, a transformer and a writer, um, and you have a lot to manage, we actually have a feature types connection window um, where you can make connections in bulk between different transformers, readers, and writers. Um, and I'll just share that link in the chat. I didn't know about it for a long time. And when I discovered it, it was kind of a revelation and maybe it'll be the same for some of you. Yeah. Uh, there's another question by John, which I think is for you again, Sinai. Uh, <laughs> any best practices for keeping vector tiles up to date? Um, that's a good question. I think that would kind of depend on uh, your workflow specifics. But of course, with FME server, um, we can set up workspaces on a schedule to read and write data. So it would be a lot like a database uh, synchronization or update. You could run a workspace every morning, every week, um, every five minutes to pull data from your most up to date source and write out those um, vector tiles, uh, wherever you need to pull them from. Um, that would be a good way of going about it. Of course, with the other triggers, uh, in server automations, uh, you could probably configure that many other ways. So directory watches, uh, would be a good option. Even webhooks, if you're pulling, uh, data from a service that supports webhooks, um, that would be, uh, the way I'd go about it anyways. Uh, for keeping data sets like vector tiles up to date. 
Yeah. Great. Good question. Yeah. Uh, we have another one as well. Uh, so can you produce a standalone leaflet web map without any requirements for licensing from Esri or Mapbox? And the answer to that is yes. So as far as I'm aware, like Mapbox would always, you'd always need that API key to get it to work. But as far as I'm aware, I've never had to use an API key to get um, an Esri leaflet map to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, you would just need to select the base map. And then um, just like that, you can get the HTML report generator creating your web maps for you without any need for keys or licensing. Yeah, I believe it's all open source. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's another one for a web map. Can we make use of any free addressing services? Uh, they thought they'd seen it before in FME webinars. Yeah, I think, uh, would that be OpenStreetMap? Yeah, I think. Free to use? Yeah, mm -hmm. OpenStreetMap is. I can't think of another one, though. I think you have, um, with a free account on Mapbox, sort of a limited access to their addressing services. But um, OpenStreetMap, as far as I, I know, is, is um, unlimited. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there is another question that frequently comes up in the past about um, working with uh, ArcGIS online web maps and how to integrate those with your uh, FME workflows. So uh, we frequently found that um, you can make different workflows like change detection where you're keeping updates and just um, pushing new features onto a new uh, web map that's on ArcGIS Online. With that, you would simply need to use the Esri ArcGIS Online feature service writer. Um, so um, that comes in a lot of use when it comes to like building those web maps that's not necessarily created with the HTML report generator, but you can still use FME to um, create those maps on ArcGIS Online. Uh, yeah, if anyone has any other questions, definitely let us know in the question panel. Okay. And if we don't have any more questions, oh, there's someone typing in right now. <laughs> You know, when we got last time was kind of like, what are the limits of using FME server for this? Like, what happens if you get multiple requests at one time? Uh, Marcus and I, do you want to answer that one? Um, yeah, I guess, uh, depending on the type of workflow or web map, um, when it comes to different or multiple requests at the same time on FME server, if it requires running a workspace, that would be running on uh, your FME server engines. So um, the amount of traffic that you can handle would be dependent on how fast it takes to run these workspaces and how many engines you have on FME server. Because you can run uh, one workspace at a time per engine, and you can have multiple engines on your server. Um, but then if you have expectations for very high traffic, but um, few, very small and short, quick processes and jobs, then you could definitely look into the credit-based engines, because um, those can be a lot more um, economical for you. OK, great. I think if that's everything, we can wrap up. All right, yeah, sounds good. Good questions, everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for attending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I can wrap this up now. Yeah, so um, thank you to everyone who joined our webinar today and also to our amazing presenters. 
Um, I will leave the webinars open for a few minutes longer, just in case uh, you still have any question or you want to save any links from the chat. Um, also, we always love to hear your feedback and how we can improve on our webinars. So uh, please let us know what you thought of our webinar today through our survey. And hope you all have a great rest of your day and thank you so much for attending. Bye.